Okay, to summarize everything we said so far, science is hard and imperfect because people are subjective and, you know, everything else having to do with people is also hard and imperfect. Relationships, uh, politics, everything. So now we're going to go through the history of psychology and neuroscience, starting with ancient world uh, and up to the present day. So uh, there actually wasn't any kind of scientific approach to uh, psychology or neuroscience in the sense of actual experiments for you know many, many years. Uh, but there was plenty of philosophy and that philosophy set the framework and foundation for the scientific work that comes up thereafter. So you can trace it all the way back to the Buddha uh, and uh, the key insights about the source of human suffering uh, in terms of patterns of thoughts. So this is actually remarkably current in terms of cognitive and behavioral therapy, which really emphasizes that uh, our mental disorders can be treated by treating those patterns of thought. The treatment, uh, according to the Buddha, was uh, to lose your uh, attachments and gain freedom so that you don't become obsessed with these thoughts that are guided towards achieving those attachments or, or being kind of controlled by those attachments. Of course, the ancient Greeks had a lot to say about the philosophy of mind. Uh, what and where is the mind? How is this substance different from uh, physical uh, uh, substances? Uh, is reality even real? So Plato's cave is a very famous, the allegory of the cave, where we're kind of looking at shadows on the wall and the reality, some, some great pure reality is outside the cave casting those shadows. Uh, a lot of discussion about nature versus nurture, empiricism, how we learn. Aristotle was very concerned with logic and trying to found a kind of logical positivism based on axioms that are kind of, you know, pure and irrefutable um, and seeing how you could build up a system of reason and logic based on that. Uh, a lot of discussion about the connections between thought and emotion, but again, no actual experiments. In the Renaissance time period, you have these uh, more extensive picking up on a lot of those uh, Greek traditions, thinking about rationalism versus empiricism. So again, this kind of logical uh, principled basis of understanding how the mind might work uh, and, and, and understanding what might be true uh, based on logical principles versus empiricism, which is says that you really just learn uh, everything uh, that we know based on experience. And John Locke here pictured is one of the protagonists of that idea. I see there's a remarkable resemblance between John Locke and Jeff Hinton later. So, you know, I think the key thing is in all of these dichotomous kinds of approaches is that you really need both. Uh, you need to have some principles. You need to have some way of understanding things. Here we're talking about the principles of compression and contrast. Those are really high level ways of understanding how we organize and simplify our knowledge. Um, yet you also need the bottom up kind of data to feed into these to understand what's actually happening um, and to learn. And so, you know, both the kind of top-down rationalist uh, uh, principled approach and this kind of more bottom-up data-driven empiricist approach really makes sense. So finally, in 1879, we have the advent of what we consider a true uh, uh, science of psychology with Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, and he was really the first person that we know of who tried to collect real data. Um, and so, and therefore is kind of the, the actual kind of considered to be the first true psychologist. Now, <laughs> the problem was, and this is, this is Wundt here. Um, and then, uh, the problem was that the data was all subjective. And so you, you get this great advance of actually collecting data, but then the data that was collected was purely kind of introspective reports. Um, and his student, Tickner, uh, uh, really advanced this idea of structuralism and sort of trying to really categorize the structure of the subjective experience. And if you actually try to do that yourself, you'll find it's actually quite <laughs> challenging. Uh, there's lots of different ways of thinking about it. And uh, that kind of ambiguity, the subjectiveness of that enterprise of trying to organize our subjective experience into some categories and things like that. Um, 
is really what fueled the next revolution in psychology. I just want to mention here William James down here at the bottom. These are both photographs, which is interesting to see the real people. James's contribution is largely with respect to theoretical ideas as opposed to ex experimental data. So a little bit of a throwback to the philosophical approach. Many papers today still cite James and his insights. So he, even though he wasn't uh, generating data, he had remarkable uh, uh, lasting insights into how the mind works. Okay, so then finally in the early 1900s, in reaction to that very subjectivist kind of approach, you got the, the movement of behaviorism. And this really says, no, not only do we need data, we need objective data. The only thing that counts, in fact, for them was a uh, measurement of real behavior. And that's why it's called behaviorism. So what do people do? That's what we can measure, that's objective. Everything else is just a bunch of kind of, you know, sort of Freudian, whatever, kind of philosophizing uh, introspection. It's all wishy-washy. So Pavlov and his dogs and showing how he could discover these principles of learning that were present, the, the classic kind of Pavlovian conditioning that we'll learn about in chapter five, and then instrumental conditioning with B.F. Skinner and the Skinner boxes. And these guys really thought, you know, hey, this is how everybody learns. And Skinner, you know, thought uh, babies could be reared in these Skinner boxes, conditioning them to, to learn to push buttons to lights and stuff. And then J.B. Watson is another major figure in this area. So this approach was dominant up through the 50s. And as is typical, you end up with a counter-revolution in the 60s, the revolutionary 60s. And, uh, and, and people started to really sort of react against the minimalist approach of the behaviorists and say, well, wait a second, you know, there may be actually something going on in that mind of ours. Um, and, you know, here's our little far side cartoon, the obligatory far side cartoon, stimulus response, stimulus response. Don't you ever think, um, <laughs> and you know, uh, the use of amoebas in this kind of diagram is, is critical because I mean, come on folks. I mean, if you're a behaviorist in, in the 1900s, you still have your own mind. You still have your introspective knowledge you got to realize you have all these thoughts going on in your head and that those thoughts are shaping your behavior in really important ways. How could they possibly think, yeah, you can understand all of behavior with just this very simple stimulus response. It's crazy. Right. And this was the dominant perspective for like 50 years in psychology. And this goes to show you, as we were saying, how subjective hypothesis uh, generation is. Right. So when you when you, when you, constrain the, way, the hypotheses that you're going to entertain, everything you think about is kind of in that space of those hypotheses. And so uh, if you have a paradigm, this belief that, that the only thing you can, can understand is this objective stimulus response, then everything ends up being about that. But that clearly underestimates the nature of the human brain. The other major development that takes place in the 60s, of course, is the advent of digital computers. And these Although they were, the principles were developed in the 30s with uh, Turing et al., um, they really start to come online in the 60s and people see, hey, we can understand how thinking might work by reference or by analogy to these digital computers. And you have this notion of the information processing paradigm, thinking about the human mind as an information processing system. And this leads to a lot of great advances in thinking about how memory works, how central processing might work in the mind, how logic and reason might actually take place in, in, in a really well-formulated, mechanistic, kind of precise way. Um, and so, you know, here's our diagram. Behaviorism is just about stimulus response. Cognitive psychology really starts to unpack these mental processes. And by using the computer metaphor, it escapes the kind of kind of wishy-washy basis of introspectionism and says, well, look, we can, we can actually understand this in a much uh, more concrete, uh, real kind of solid level uh, by understanding how information processing works in digital computers. And so that was a huge revolution again. And then uh, based on uh, new technology, again, the advent of the ability to really scan what's happening inside the brain, 
also just the accumulation of all the research that had been going on in neuroscience over the years, kind of as a parallel track in a lot of ways to what was happening in, in the main developments in psychology, you end up with a real solid understanding emerging about how the brain works. And then starting really in the 1990s, there was a real integration of that neuroscience into this otherwise kind of information processing cognitive picture. And that gives rise to this new movement of cognitive neuroscience. And uh, this is showing you here the MRI machine, which really revolutionized and made this kind of neuroscience-based approach available to a large number of researchers around the world. These MRI machines are in many, many medical facilities. And so you could now really start to uh, see inside the human brain uh, see what's happening when people are doing any different kind of activity. And believe me, every single conceivable thing that you could look at inside of a brain scanner has been looked at. Trust me, look it up, everything. So uh, so now you, you, you have the tools to really try to put together what's happening kind of under the hood. And again, this is an objective source of data about what parts of the brain are active when different things are going on cognitively. Uh, and putting those two together gives you these sort of neural correlates of what's happening inside the brain as the mind is functioning. A huge revolution. My own training and my kind of, you know, little corner of the world of uh, the, the broader field of psychology is based on this approach uh, developing an understanding of how the brain works at a kind of finer grain in terms of neural networks. And so David Rummelhart, Jay McClellan, and Jeff Hinton, there he is in his Lockean Jeff Hinton look, um, really uh, innovated and built upon a lot of work that had taken place through the 60s uh, that uh, earlier people had done um, to develop a, a real thorough understanding of how properties of individual neurons and networks of neurons could then explain the kinds of overall cognitive functions that take place in our minds. And so that connection between neural networks and you know higher level psych psychology was really forged in this work in the 80s, became very popular and kind of overturned a lot of the simpler uh, computer metaphor ideas that had been developed earlier. And now I think we really are getting to a point where we have a nice synthesis of this neural level computation, also some, some very important insights from how computers process information and putting that all together with all the, the available neuroscience to really understand what's going on. Psychology is behind the AI revolution that is currently taking place. A credible pace of advance in AI based on the same kind of neural network approaches. Most of it's focused on kind of machine learning and computer science objectives not necessarily understanding how the how the mind works furthermore but applying these technologies to solve you know real computational problems in the world so being able to recognize images being able to recognize speech the classic example being like these personal digital assistants siri et al are using these deep neural networks to understand what you say to understand kind of perception and those had long been areas where traditional symbolic computers had not done very well at all. And so the brain, it seems, is very, very powerful at doing this kind of pattern recognition process. That's what these neural networks do. And so understanding those principles, which again has taken place over the last 30 years, is now really coming into fruition with the, with the current technology. <clears throat> so in particular, Jeff Hinton published a paper in 2012 that really kicked off this current uh, revolution in AI approaches to neural networks building on, again, so much of the earlier work, but he has been always amazingly right at the forefront uh, of these approaches throughout this whole time period. And so if you get a chance to read a biography about him, it's, it's quite amazing. And you can see here a picture from his uh, early days. You know, it's very interesting. You know, I know these people personally, uh, and, you know, Jay McClellan was my advisor. And, and so, you know, a lot of times these people, you think of these scientists as being these kind of like, you know, abstract figures and, and historical people, but, you know, they're regular people. We know these people individually. And uh, so it kind of humanizes the whole approach. And I, I think that's an awesome picture of Jeff. All right. He looks like somebody from Pink Floyd, maybe, or something.
at the end of all this, at the current day, we're actually in a pretty amazing time in the field of psychology and neuroscience, where I think we have a huge amount of data about uh, how behavior works, how cognition works, how the brain works, and can put all that together and really understand uh, kind of integrated understanding of how it all works. And that's really been my mission, my research mission. And that's what I'm trying to capture here in this textbook is that kind of synthesis that allows us to understand the whole scope of psychology and neuroscience in an integrated coherent picture. Here's a graph showing you publication terms in papers that have been published over the years, kind of do documenting the rise and fall of these different approaches. So yeah, again, uh, the behavioral approach rising and then falling, uh, cognitive kind of rising up in the 60s, and then neuroscience catching up. And uh, meanwhile, kind of a steady dribble of psychoanalytic Freudian kind of work uh, kind of going on in parallel. And so there have been a lot of these other trends that haven't been captured in that, in that previous description of the history. So obviously Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, a kind of icon of psychology, those ideas haven't really penetrated in the current, uh, <laughs> those ideas haven't really carried forward in our modern understanding of psychology too much. It's been kind of this dark closets of, of psychology, so to speak, uh, the role of the unconscious and, and the id, ego, and superego, uh, but very, very influential, obviously, in the popular understanding. And I think actually probably we could learn a lot by going back and trying to integrate a lot of those ideas into our current understanding. Uh, there's also been a huge movement of gestalt psychology, this notion of kind of holistic processing and we'll return to that when we look in the perception chapter. There's also a, a very big trend in humanism, sort of understanding it's like, uh, the human being, not just as a kind of like, you know, this behaviorist kind of, you know, uh, animal-like entity that we study as a subject, but really thinking about the whole person, the whole social, uh, individual self-efficacy you know, understanding the whole package of, of a person as opposed to just sort of this uh, cold scientific microscopic view of, of people. Uh, Jean Piaget was one of the pioneers in understanding development, and we'll look at his work extensively in the development chapter. And there's been many other kind of trends going throughout. And again, we'll look at uh, all the work in social and personality psychology and how that has built on these different kinds of principles. Um, and again, we're going to try to integrate all that work together into a single coherent picture. But in the field, as it stands today, it's still sort of broken up. You know, there's there's a lot of integration taking place, but there are these traditional fields like social and personality tend to be thought of as a separate sort of subfield of psychology relative to cognitive and neuroscience. Again, I think that we can really put them together usefully and, and have a more integrated understanding.